talk to you today about several different ways we can conquer this National Registry written exam. So a couple things that I want to touch on today. I want to touch on some strategies on how to take the National Written Exam, some tips on when you are taking it, and um, we're going to work through some questions and utilize those strategies today. So starting straight off, I want to talk about some tips when taking the National Registry exam. So number one, change the way you read the question. So when you read the question, read the last sentence first. Okay, This is a whole different ball game than what you guys did through high school. Then read the four answers and try to find the best answer that you can answer that question with out of those A, B, C, and D type questions and see if you can answer that. If you can, great. Uh, but then after you answer it, don't move on to the next question. Go back and read through the question, the whole question, and see if that still matches. If it doesn't, then maybe you need to change your answer. But then read through the question, the whole question, and then see if your answer still matches. If your answer matches, answer it and move on. Um, because not all questions are going to be the what is the first, uh, what does A in ABC mean? Or what is the first part of patient assessment? What is the very first thing you're going to do? There's different ways they're going to word these questions. Number two, think simply. The National Registry is not trying to trick you in taking these tests. Uh, you know, remember BLS before ALS, and for the EMT level, Make sure to do your basic life support care and think easy before hard. So if it's something that you can do a, let's see, a basic lifting the head of the cot to have the patient breathe better or putting a towel under the shoulders of a pediatric instead of doing blow by oxygen or a bag valve mask, do something simple before you do something hard. And I always like to say, ooh, shiny. If it's shiny, uh, probably need to back off from doing that type of uh, answer there. Next thing is, remember, it's one question. And think of it as one question. Don't think of the question before. Don't think of the question that's coming up next. Treat that question as the question you're dealing with right now. Because if you try to think about the question you did before and you're thinking about it and you're stressing about it and you're like, oh, did I answer the right question? You're going to screw yourselves up. If you move on to the next question and you're thinking about, oh, what am I going to have next? Oh, is it going to be the next thing that I'm not going to know and, and you're freaking out about it? You're not going to answer that question that you're dealing with. It's just like going on an EMS call. You're going to deal with that patient that you have right here, right now, and go about that patient care that same way. So remember, you're going to have a bunch of questions, so you're going to need to be able to do that on every single question. Remember your BLS algorithm, what you need to do first in CPR, and then what's next, and what's next, and what's next, and then you hook up an AED, and then what's next, and what's next. So remember your BLS algorithm uh, for uh, CPR for one and two rescuer. Remember your uh, choking for responsive and unresponsive adult and pediatric. Um, and then also remember your patient assessment and how that rolls through for trauma and medical in your patient assessment. And finally, mindset is everything for these tips. Mindset is everything. Go in there to take the heart out of this dragon, okay? You're going in. You can do this. You've studied all semester. You've got this information. And you know the answer. Go with your gut. Don't second guess yourself. You know the answer. And conquer that dragon. Take its heart out from it. So this is your moment. Act like it is. So now we're going to talk about some different types of strategies when taking these questions and how to work through that just like reading that last sentence. Okay, so some different strategies that you want to be working on when doing the National Registry exam. Take your time. Remember, when on scene, walk. And if you have the urge to run, walk slower. Don't let the stress of this test gets you carried away because that will ultimately cause you to fail. Just chillax and just keep walking slower. There's no previous question. There's no next question. There's only the present question that you're dealing with. Okay, so when you're dealing with the question, you'll have your four answers here. You'll have A, B, C, and D. Okay, and with those, 
you want to identify the oddballs that you are working with and get rid of those, leaving you two plausible solutions. And with those plausibles, you want to try to eliminate one of those plausibles to get your answer that you're going with, all right? So also, the National Registry is required to give you a dry erase board or a dry erase paper, and that's what you're going to use to uh, write things down, do some math, maybe draw a picture. If you're trying to do the rule of nines, draw out your little man and draw out a little chubby man and label what you are going to be doing uh, for how much it is, you know, you know, you've got uh, 18 for the chest and one and, and so on and so forth. Add in those numbers and draw out your rule of nine so that when you answer that burn question, you can feel like you're more accurate. Or writing down sample or OPQSTI so that you have those so you don't freak out and like, oh, I can't remember sample. You've got them all written out on the piece of paper that you have provided. Now, if you fill up that whole piece of paper, you have the ability to raise up and they'll come get it from you. They'll bring you a new, nice, clean one. So don't worry about that. It's uh, it's dirty and you and you can't erase it because you're not allowed to erase. But they'll bring you a new one. Okay. Um, so learn to accept defeat. But I'm not saying don't give up. Uh, what I am saying is, if you have taken those that answer, and you've taken out the two oddballs, and you've got the two plausible here, and you're like. Boy, I just don't know this question. I've never seen this question before. I just have no clue what's going on. Just make sure that you're making an educated guess on what you think it is. Think through it a little bit, but don't spend a lot of time on it. Uh, and don't stress about it. But just go with your gut, answer the question, and you may be right, you may be wrong. But if you keep doing that throughout the questions and just dealing with one question at a time, you'll do just fine. Okay, now we're gonna talk about some different questions and we're gonna go through some of these techniques, okay? So some very specific techniques to be using um, is follow your patient assessment. Work through from scene size up, primary assessment, secondary assessment, reassessment, transport, okay? Treatment for your patient. So when I talk about that, uh, what's the best treatment for your patient or what should you do first? Remember to vomit your patient. So that's vitals, oxygen, monitor, IV, which we don't use IV in EMT class, okay? And so that's going to be impression and transport, okay? Or interventions. Interventions is what I like to use, interventions. So use, use that for answering your questions. So that again is vitals, oxygen, monitor, interventions, and transport. Okay. The next strategy I have is which came first, the chicken or the egg? So obviously, without going back way back to uh, the, when the world began, uh, we're not going to talk about what, which came first there, but I'm talking about when you think of right now, an egg comes first, then the chicken comes second. So which came first? So they may have a which came first type of question. Um, so think back to your patient assessment, think back to uh, CPR, what are you supposed to do first? Okay? Not what you think you're supposed to do, but what are you supposed to do first? So look through the question and see what they've got. And then break down the big words. If you've got a word like myocarditis and you're like, oh boy, I don't even remember learning about this. Okay, let's try to break down the word. Okay, We all know, and I know you all know, that cardi or cardiac is the heart. You know, you've learned that. Cardiology, cardiac. Okay, so try to find a word that you know. And a lot of people know itis, and that's inflammation. So you've got inflammation of the heart. So you can get rid of your oddballs, find the one that's got heart and inflammation, and then myo. Always try to think of a word that is close to that word. So muscle, myo, muscle, myo. They both start with M, they're very close. And so inflammation of the heart muscle, that's what myocarditis is. So break down those big words. Finally, the one that I like to do and just make sure that you feel ready and that you can go conquer that dragon is watch a motivational video right before you go take that test. You can get on YouTube, you can type in motivational videos and there's a whole bunch of them. Find just a short one, a five minute one, and it'll motivate you and you can do this, all right? You can do this, you can conquer this test, just follow these simple strategies and tactics. All right, now let's get into the, the deep into the weeds with looking at some different types of questions and breaking them down.
Okay, so question number one. We've got a question here. So let's try to break this down. So there's really no last sentence here. This is a one sentence type question. So you won't always get the last sentence questions. But let's read the question and see what we're going to have to do with. So the question is, an area of the swelling or enlargement in a weakened arterial wall is called. Okay, do we even have a clue what that is? Some of you may, may know right off the bat what that is. Good for you. Okay, let's say you've never seen this question before and we're going to try to break it down. Okay, so A is thrombus, B is aneurysm, C is embolism, and D is atherosclerosis. Okay, so first of all, this is an area of swelling or enlargement in a weakened arterial wall is called. So first of all, look at your answers and see if you can find what you think the correct answer is. If you don't, let's break them down. So find your two ones that are, are your oddballs. So what's an embolism? Well, that is a blood clot that's traveling through the vessels. Okay, so is that an area of swelling or enlargement? If it's traveling, no. So let's cross out embolism. That's one of our oddballs. Now we have uh, atherosclerosis. Well, that's the hardening of the arteries, and that kind of fits uh, for what's going on because we're talking about art, art, arterial walls, okay? Um, so that one's a plausible one, okay? What about thrombus? That's a blood clot. Does it say anywhere in there about a blood clot? No, it doesn't talk about anything like a blood clot or a mass of blood or clumping or anything like that. So let's throw out thrombus. Okay, so we've got two left, aneurysm and atherosclerosis. Now, if you remember back, an aneurysm is like a balloon, okay? It's ballooning, it's swelling or enlargement of a weakened arterial. So it's like a balloon, it's getting thin, okay? And it's just about ready to pop. And when we have a burst aneurysm, that's when it pops, okay? So we're gonna make an educated guess based on the information we know that it's aneurysm. And when we look up the question and we check it, we would be correct because aneurysm is the correct answer. So let's tackle another question. A 50 year old male was stung by a honeybee approximately 15 minutes ago. He presents with respiratory distress, facial swelling, and hypotension. After placing him on oxygen and administering his epinephrine via auto injector, you note that his breathing has improved. Additionally, his facial swelling is resolving and his blood pressure is stable. Your next action should be. So that's back to one of those strategies that what are we gonna do next? So with that, we're gonna go with the vomit assessment. Okay, so remember that V stands for vitals. So have we gotten any vitals on this patient? Why, yes we have. It says that his blood pressure is stable and we've got him on oxygen. Okay, and we've also given a drug, so we are assuming that we got a full set of vitals. So vitals, we can go check. Okay, do we have any oxygen on this patient? Well, it says after placing him on oxygen and administering his epinephrine via auto injector, you note that his breathing has improved. So oxygen, we can go check. Okay, and additionally, his facial swelling is resolving and his blood pressure is stable. So not only have we gotten a set of vitals before, and given our drug, but we also got a set of vitals after we've given the medication. So that's reassessment. So we've got our medication, which is monitoring our patient. So we can go check. Have we done any interventions? Well, initially this guy had what we believe to be an anaphylactic shock. We gave epinephrine, so that was an intervention. We also gave oxygen. So those are both interventions, okay? And then finally, are we transporting him? Have we transported yet? No, we haven't transported, okay? So we need to be looking for an answer that's talking about transporting. Okay, so A says, reassess his breathing and blood pressure in 15 minutes. We've already monitored this patient. We don't need to worry about that. B says, record his time and dose of the injection and transport promptly. C says to visualize his airway and to assess for orange pharyngeal swelling. We've already assessed his airway. We know that it's reducing in swelling. We know that he's improving after the epinephrine we gave him. 
So we don't need to be worrying about that. We can cross A and C out, okay? Those are our outliers, okay? D says notify medical control of the patient's response to your treatment, okay? You could notify medical control, but how about this? We're still looking for a question that has transport. We have transport. Does record the time of the dose of the injection, is that close to what we would be telling to medical control? That's exactly what you'd be telling medical control. You would tell them what you did and how they're improving and what the dose and time was so that you can give that to the doctor when you arrive at the facility. And it also says transport promptly. That's the last one we have to answer there. So B is the correct answer for this question. So that's how you tackle a question using the vomit assessment, looking through your question, answering V-O-M-I-T for vitals, oxygen, monitor, in interventions, and transport, and looking for those throughout your question and answering the proper question. Okay, so this one's a little more difficult of a question. You have to do a lot of assuming with this question, okay? But this is how we're gonna tackle this one. All right, let me first read the question. You are assessing a 25-year-old woman who is 39 weeks pregnant. She is experiencing regular contractions that are approximately three minutes apart and states that her amniotic sac broke two hours ago. After taking the standard precautions, you should A. Transport her immediately B. Apply high flow O2 C. Place her on her left side or D. Assess her for crowning. Okay, so number one, we know how old our patient is, and we've got a idea of what we've been called to, okay? Um, so we have to do a little bit of thinking. So if we are doing, uh, yes, they say standard precautions, and standard precautions sounds like BSI, so the next thing in our patient assessment we'd think about would be applying high flow O2. And if you try to use the vomit on this one, you're going to be doing O2, placing her on her left side, or transporting her immediately, which are not the correct answer. So let's try to lead into D, assessing her for crowning. So she tells you that they're approximately three minutes apart and states that her amniotic sac broke two hours ago. Okay, so here's where this falls into. Onset. When did it start? So where are we at in our patient assessment? We are already down in the secondary assessment. We've already done all of our primary assessment up to this point, okay? And then can you give us, and what led up to this, okay? That's events leading up to, okay? So we've done OPQSTI and sample, okay? Even though it may have one answer in there that follows sample, you don't have to have all of them, you are roughly saying that you covered OPQSTI and sample. So where are we at in the patient assessment? Well, we're ready for vital signs. Well, is there anything in here about vital signs? No. What's the next best thing you can do? Well, is it not a vital sign or at least a uh, thing that you can check for if you assess her for crowning? You're not delivering the baby. That's not what it says. It says assess for crowning. That's a vital sign that's you know looking to see how your patient is doing. So the next thing you wanna be doing is assessing her for crowning because you took your standard precautions getting ready for this pregnancy and now you're assessing for crowning, okay? And that's why this is the correct answer. Transporting her immediately, you've already passed transport. Applying high flow O2, you should have already done that. Placing her on her left side, if you were transporting her, you should have placed her on her left side. So you see how all those are working into creating this question and how you can answer it better. So I hope this video has helped you guys. I hope everything you've learned, you can now tackle test questions a whole lot better. And this will give you something you can go back to and uh, review before you go take your national registry or while you're studying for your national registry. You guys have a good day and uh, we'll see you later. Thank <laughs> you.